Welcome everyone to session one of this online course on freshwater health. This first session focuses on fundamentals of freshwater health and consists of five topics. This is topic one, freshwater ecosystems. My name is Michael McLean and I'm a professor of ecohydrology at IHE Delft in the Netherlands. IHE Delft is offering this online course in collaboration with Conservation International, which, like us, is working to preserve and restore freshwater health around the world. This lecture and the activities accompanying it are designed to introduce you to freshwater ecosystems. I'll define what freshwater ecosystems are and show you some of the main types. Next, we'll look at how freshwater ecosystems are interconnected in the larger water cycle and with adjoining terrestrial or land ecosystems. We'll spend some time reviewing the wide variety of biota inhabiting freshwater ecosystems and how they interact with one another. But freshwater ecosystems are more than biota, so we'll also consider their hydrology and physical structure, as well as water quality. All combined, these elements determine the integrity of freshwater ecosystems and their resilience, which is their ability to withstand and recover from natural and human interferences. Maintaining freshwater ecosystem integrity and resilience is fundamental to maintaining their health. So let's begin with a definition. Freshwater ecosystems are dynamic, self-sustaining systems composed of all living organisms interacting among themselves and with the physical environment. They're composed of potentially thousands of individual species ranging from microbes to large mammals, all striving to meet their needs for energy and reproduction. Freshwater ecosystems are dynamic, which means they change over time, from season to season or over many years. And they're self-sustaining, which means the different components interact in ways to sustain and regulate system integrity, and thus health. Biotic interactions among native species, natural flow and sediment levels, and suitable water quality all contribute to sustaining freshwater ecosystems. Freshwater ecosystems come in many shapes and sizes. Lakes, rivers, and wetlands will already be familiar to you. Lakes are bodies of standing or slow-flowing water, ranging in size from small ponds to great lakes like Lake Victoria in East Africa. Rivers are bodies of flowing water, ranging from small streams to the mighty Amazon River of South America. Wetlands are areas flooded seasonally or permanently. Like lakes, wetlands are standing or slow-flowing water bodies, but differ in that they're underlain by hydric soils and contain distinct plant communities adapted to waterlogged soils. There are also subterranean freshwater ecosystems filled with groundwater. These include water-filled caves and fissures, as well as groundwater of shallow aquifers. Specially adapted organisms called stygofauna inhabit these subterranean ecosystems. Freshwater ecosystems are components of the water cycle, in which water evaporates from oceans, the landscape, and freshwater bodies and is transported as atmospheric water until raining down on the Earth's surface. Water precipitating on land will flow to the ocean again in rivers and aquifers. Along the way, it's temporarily stored in lakes, rivers, wetlands, and aquifers. Differences in the rates water is added or removed from freshwater ecosystems determines changes in their volume over days, months, seasons, and years. Water is continually being replenished in freshwater ecosystems as it makes its way back to the ocean or atmosphere. Freshwater ecosystems are also connected to the terrestrial ecosystems adjoining them by flowing water and animal movements. Water runoff from the landscape replenishes the quantity of water in freshwater ecosystems and washes in needed organic matter, nutrients, and sediment. Animals moving from terrestrial to freshwater ecosystems also transport energy and nutrients. For example, hippos consume terrestrial grasses and later return to water bodies and deposit the partially digested organic matter into freshwater ecosystems in their feces. Many other animals move between freshwater and terrestrial ecosystems, and the transport of material occurs in both directions. 
Now that we've defined what freshwater ecosystems are, looked at the different types, and considered how they're interconnected with each other in the terrestrial landscape, let's take some time to explore the many forms of life inhabiting them. Let's begin with aquatic plants that use the energy of sunlight to synthesize water, carbon dioxide, and nutrients into energy-rich organic compounds. Aquatic plants range from algae to large macrophytes. They're primary producers and form the base of food chains in freshwater ecosystems. Larger plants are also important components of the physical structure of freshwater ecosystems, serving as habitats for other organisms, slowing the velocity of flowing water, and facilitating the deposition of suspended sediments. Riparian vegetation growing along the margins of freshwater ecosystems is also an important component of the system. It provides an important energy source and substrate in the form of falling leaves, branches, and trunks. In addition, riparian vegetation stabilizes riverbanks and provides habitat to a wide range of animal species. Riparian plants have special adaptations enabling them to live in the high moisture and high disturbance regimes that characterize river corridors and lake margins. Many animals can consume plants directly, but decomposers are also essential in the transfer of energy from plants to animals. Decomposers, or secondary producers, include microscopic bacteria and protozoa, as well as fungi. They're able to break down complex organic molecules into simpler forms, more palatable for insects and other detritus-consuming organisms. These organisms also commonly occur together in biofilms, coating organic detritus and rock surfaces. If you've ever experienced slippery stones or logs when entering a lake or crossing a stream, then you've come in contact with biofilms. Insects are an incredibly diverse group of organisms inhabiting freshwater ecosystems, with more than 75,000 different species identified. The larval stages of many insects are aquatic and the adult stage terrestrial. A diverse insect community is important to the healthy function of river corridors, as insects form a critical link in energy transfers from lower to higher trophic levels. Certain insect groups also serve as sensitive indicators of water quality. The most abundant groups of insects are flies, beetles, and dragonflies. Mollusks and crustaceans are common in freshwater ecosystems and serve important functions. Mollusks include snails and clams. Snails mainly colonize rock surfaces where they feed on biofilms, while clams are generally filter feeders and filter fine organic matter and plankton from the water column. Snails and clams are consumed by larger predators, including fish and riverine mammals. Crustaceans include shrimp, crabs, crayfish, and amphipods. Crustaceans are mainly omnivorous filterers and scavengers and are important in organic matter decomposition. They too are preyed upon by larger predators. Fish are the best known and most valued animals in freshwater ecosystems. To date, more than 15,000 species of freshwater fish have been identified, with some of the predominant families shown here. Many fish are predators and others are detritivores, but virtually all river fish rely on multiple habitats that change with season and flow regime. To access the resources and habitats they need throughout their lives, some fish must migrate long distances along rivers and between rivers, lakes, and even the sea. Their annual movements are one of the important dynamic elements of freshwater ecosystems. Reptiles found in freshwaters include turtles, snakes, and crocodiles, which are air breathers and mostly predators. They have specific preferences for slow or fast-flowing waters, and also rely on healthy riparian habitats. Amphibians include salamanders, newts, toads, and frogs that are generally short-lived and develop as larvae in water. They're generally predators, feeding on insects and crustaceans. There are many species of waterfowl and many more species of birds that live in riparian corridors and feed primarily on aquatic plants, fish, and insects. 
Species of dippers and ducks dive beneath the water and hunt or forage along the river bottom. Many species of waterfowl also migrate during the year, visiting different freshwater ecosystems in different seasons. And finally, there are many mammals inhabiting aquatic ecosystems and riparian corridors, or regularly visiting rivers to drink. Species that actually spend most or all of their time in the water include beaver, otters, hippos, and dolphins. Beaver and hippos are well-known animal engineers that may strongly modify river environments by felling riparian trees and building debris dams or by creating pools and cutting large gullies through riparian areas. As mentioned previously, hippos feed on terrestrial grasses and transport large amounts of terrestrial plant material to rivers. The diverse biota composing freshwater ecosystems are continually interacting with each other in complex food webs and competing for needed habitats and other resources. The details of these biotic interactions and the species involved change from season to season and year to year, but the basic processes remain the same. But biota are not only interacting with each other, they're also interacting with the changing physical components of freshwater ecosystems. Let's look at a few of those now. Let's first consider the flows and levels of water in freshwater ecosystems and changes in water volume over time. When we speak of flows and levels, we must remember that we're talking about the entire volume of space available to aquatic organisms. Their habitable world extends only to the three-dimensional limits of the rivers or lakes or aquifers volume. And for riparian species, their world extends to the limits of the water body's influence. Inside that available volume, freshwater species must carry out all the functions of life. Animals must be born, eat and grow, find shelter, and reproduce to create the next generation. They need space to carry out these functions and interconnected habitats that are suitable for their needs and available at the necessary times of year. As flow levels rise and fall in rivers, the volume of space available to aquatic organisms changes and new habitats either become available or disappear. These habitats are available at certain frequencies and for durations of time equivalent to the frequency and duration of flows. They appear at certain times of the year, also in association with the timing of flows. Organisms are adapted to make use of these habitats when they're available and they time their life history events, such as spawning or dropping seeds, to be synchronized with the natural, seasonal, and annual fluctuations of the river. Here's an example to illustrate these points. This is an image of an East African river, and we see terrestrial species like elephants also taking advantage of the riverine habitats and, of course, drinking the river's water. The graphic superimposed on the photo is a flow duration curve, and it indicates the percent of time over the course of a year that specific flow levels are exceeded. Note from the shape of the curve that the lowest flows are exceeded most of the year, while the highest flows are exceeded only for brief periods. The flow condition in the photo corresponds to dry season base flows. At this time, water is confined to the mineral stream bed. The flow is shallow, slow moving, and the wetted width is minimal. There's not a lot of habitat available, but adapted species will have evolved coping mechanisms to survive the low flow periods for the extent of time they normally occur. Higher flows during the wet season will inundate herbaceous vegetation beside the stream bed and provide new habitat for stream organisms to feed or hide. River flows will most likely also begin infiltrating into the riverbank during this season, recharging the groundwater. During floods, the water moves up the riverbank and inundates large riparian vegetation, including trees. This may trigger ecological responses from the trees and may also rejuvenate geomorphological features in the channel needed by plants and animals at lower flow levels. Geomorphology and distinct morphological features are essential components of freshwater ecosystems. 
For rivers, key features include channels, seasonally exposed gravel or sandbars, and more stable and vegetated banks. These features route water flows, are the pathways for fish movements, provide the substrates for plants to colonize, fish to lay their eggs, clams to burrow, and insects to hide. Sediment deposits are also stores of nutrients held in the mineral sediment itself or the organic matter mixed with it. Dominant sediment sizes in deposits vary depending on the energy of the system. In high-energy headwater river systems where sediment transport is greater than supply, hard bedrock may be exposed, providing limited habitat possibilities. Downstream, the substrate may include a mix of boulders, cobbles, and sand, serving as better habitat for insects and fish spawning. In lower energy systems further downstream, or in sheltered parts of headwater systems, sand will accumulate and provide prime habitat for many plant species. And in low energy environments of river floodplains or coastal areas, mud may dominate. These geomorphic features are shaped by the natural supply of sediment, variations in flow, and the influence of plants stabilizing riverbanks and slowing the velocity of river flows. Water quality determines the levels of sunlight and nutrients available to aquatic plants, oxygen available to animals, and the temperature regulating a whole range of important metabolic and biogeochemical reactions. Levels of natural organic matter determine the amount of food available to microbes, filter feeders, and other detritivores. Water quality varies naturally from one type of freshwater ecosystems to the next, depending on geology, hydrology, geomorphology, and climate. Seasonal changes are also common and natural as water levels rise and fall in rivers or lakes become seasonally stratified. Biota play an important role in regulating water quality and helping to maintain it within ranges they can tolerate. They do this by recycling nutrients and producing or consuming oxygen. They lower organic matter levels during feeding and replenish it through excretion and their own death. Aquatic macrophytes slow water movements, causing the deposition of suspended sediments and allowing for deeper penetration of sunlight. There are communities of organisms adapted to nearly every natural water quality condition on Earth, even those with little or no oxygen and extremes of heat and cold. When the biological, physical, and chemical components we've looked at for freshwater ecosystems occur within their natural ranges of variation, the system is said to have ecological integrity and a complete and integral freshwater ecosystem has the ability to support and continue to maintain its community of organisms, including species composition, diversity, and functional organization. It is, therefore, healthy. And a healthy freshwater ecosystem is also resilient, which means it's able to tolerate and recover from natural and even mild human disturbances. These mild human disturbances may include abstraction of water or alteration of natural flows and levels, harvesting of fish and other edible plants and animals, extraction of sands and gravels, and assimilation of excess organic matter and nutrient inputs. Provisioning of water, food, and materials to human communities equates to ecosystem services, as does assimilation of compounds and wastewaters. Healthy freshwater ecosystems can provide these and other services to humans sustainably, provided the disturbances continue to be modest and the system maintains its integrity. So, to summarize what we've covered in this lecture. Freshwater ecosystems are dynamic, self-sustaining systems composed of all living organisms interacting among themselves and with the physical environment. They include lakes, rivers, wetlands, and aquifers, and are interconnected by the water cycle and linked to adjacent terrestrial ecosystems by runoff and animal movements. They're composed of potentially thousands of species interacting in food webs and dependent on geomorphological, hydrological, and water quality conditions. Freshwater ecosystems have integrity when their dominant ecological characteristics occur within natural ranges of variation 
and healthy freshwater ecosystems are resilient and able to better withstand and recover from natural and human disturbances. That concludes this lecture. Now please proceed to the exercises associated with this topic to deepen your knowledge and understanding further.